Hello, my name is Robert Brill. I'm a fibromyalgia advocate and doctoral candidate in health psychology, and this is my fibromyalgia podcast series. Today I'd like to discuss why do we become deconditioned, the mechanics behind illness from bed rest. When we suffer from chronic illness, one concern we have to contend with is deconditioning. There can be consequences to all of our rest and downtime. Deconditioning can result in a reduced functional capacity of many of our body systems but mostly affects our musculoskeletal system. Deconditioning occurs at several levels and can be mild, moderate, or severe. Mild deconditioning suggests that you'll have difficulty with maximal activities like swimming, running, <clears throat> or most hardcore exercises. Moderate deconditioning suggests that you'll have difficulty with normal activities like walking, shopping, or doing chores. While severe suggests difficulty with minimal activities like just caring for yourself. Deconditioning leads to general muscle weakness, loss of performance, and muscle atrophy. The pathophysiology of contracture development suggests that just within five to seven days, the connective tissues are maintained in a shortened position. In less than two weeks, the muscle fibers and connective tissues adapt to the shortened length by contraction of collagen fibers and a decrease in muscle fibers. In three weeks, loose connective tissues and muscles and around the joints gradually change into dense connective tissue. After a short period of just a few weeks, you run the risk of bone density loss due to increased reabsorption caused by the lack of things like weight bearing, gravity, and muscle activity on bone mass. After three months, an increase in excretion of calcium in the urine and stool becomes present, and this reduces your bone density to about 50%. At this time, especially the long bones become diseased from their marrow outward, and risk of osteoporosis significantly increases. Heterotropic ossification can then occur, where the soft tissues surrounding the bones form into mature bone. Then cortical thinning occurs at ligaments. The joints become subject to flexion and contracture, cartilage degeneration, fusion, synovial atrophy, fibrofatty connective tissue infiltration, and osteoarthritis. Within one day of bed rest, you're going to have cardiovascular changes that, that occur, such as increased resting heart rate, a decrease in blood volume, fluid shifts, or maybe even POTS. Deconditioning can then lead to GI issues like decreased appetite, decreased gastric secretions, constipation, slower rate of absorption, atrophy of the intestinal mucosa and glands, and a distaste for protein-rich foods. Psychosocial risks can occur, such as depression, loss of control and motivation, anxiety, fear, neuroses, decreased concentration, feeling of helplessness, and many, many more. Central nervous system and peripheral nervous system issues can occur, like peripheral nerve compression, sedentary factors of sensory deprivation, and loss of independence, inability to effectively manipulate one's environment, and neurological sequelae, decreased visual acuity, hearing issues, lack of social stimulation, loss of sensation secondary to primary disease. <laughs> Disorientation to time and place can occur. Hallucinations, a lowered pain threshold, increased auditory threshold. 40, 40 to 50% of elderly become incontinent after just one day of bed rest. And this can lead to immobility and environmental barriers. You can have endocrine changes occur due to the altered responsiveness of hormones and enzymes. You can have glucose intolerance, altered circadian rhythm, altered temperature and sweating response, altered regulation of hormones like thyroid, adrenal, pituitary growth hormone, androgens, and plastic renin activity. By the third day of bed rest, there are reduced insulin binding sites. After two weeks of bed rest, it takes two weeks to resume activity before the glucose responds to a normal level. To stay ahead of deconditioning, you should mobilize early change positions frequently, maintain functional position of your head and your trunk and your arms and hands and legs and feet, and you should do deep breathing. Adequate coughing and, and adequate hydration are important. Active or passive range of motion exercises prevent pressure development, adequate nutrition, proper skin care, maintenance of your continence, progressive stretching, treatment of spasticity, you should remain stimulated, oriented, and social. Maintain a normal wake-sleep cycle. Encourage social visits and get outside. 
maintain a general exercise program including strengthening, endurance, and coordination exercises. So much evidence exists about the impact of becoming deconditioned. Your illness may send you into a state of just simply doing less, but consider the above before you surrender to the lack of movement and become deconditioned. Thank you.